We have the privilege and pleasure today of talking with Dr. Nancy Warner, who has been a distinguished member of our faculty at the medical school, the Hastings Professor of Pathology. Correct. Nancy, when and why did you come to the medical school at USC? A long story, which I will make short. I was at the University of Chicago. I left there in 1965, came to Old Cedars of Lebanon and spent 18 months, realized I missed academic environment, went to University of Washington in Seattle and was very happy with that environment, except that it rains constantly from October till May. So I really couldn't tolerate that. And in the meantime, I made connections with Dr. Loosely, who was an old friend from Chicago. And as you may recall, he was at one time dean of the School of Medicine. And I had done some volunteer teaching while I was at Old Cedars of Lebanon. And Helen Martin became acquainted with me. And she was my champion. She said, Hugh Edmondson, you've got to get Nancy Warner back here. So he made me an offer, which I was glad to accept. And I left Seattle and came to USC in September 1967. And I've been here ever since. What were the conditions of the medical school at that time? At the time I came, there wasn't much in the way of bricks and mortar at the School of Medicine. There was one building, and the rest was temporary construction. I think there was even a Quonset hut or two. And the second big thing that happened was the establishing of an endowment of the school for the school, which I don't know how or when that came to be, but it's been a striking phenomenon. And I believe it started in the time of Dr. Zumberg, who began to focus attention on that, and now the endowment, as you know, has achieved significant proportions. And without that, I don't think the school really could have developed. Mm -hmm. Now the question of what you do with your endowment raises its interesting head. And I think it would be nice if more emphasis was given to enriching the faculty. Well, I think if you're going to compete as a research university with Stanford and University of California and Harvard and other first-rate schools. You have to offer competitive salaries, and I don't believe we do that in the School of Medicine. I'm speaking of the School of Medicine when I say compete with, and that's the stated goal of the school now, and I'm all for it. But we must have uh, better surroundings for the faculty. Now there are buildings being made to create research space Another requirement is it will be met, but we still, I think, need to emphasize that salaries must improve. Mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, the teaching qualities that faculty bring to the School of Medicine? I think the faculty have always been inspired teachers, and we've had some marvelous teachers. And uh, I think that the process of recruiting and and, and keeping them is, is moving along. But again, you have to offer something in return, namely adequate research space and adequate compensation. And research space will be established and compensation too, I hope. Now during your time in the medical school, if I remember correctly, you were uh, uh, voted the best teacher in several years. Yes, the year two class gave me that distinction. My teaching activities were devoted to the year two students who are a very critical group. They're like sophomores anywhere. They know what they want and they don't know why they have to learn all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so... And they've had one year of experience that's right. already. Let's get on with it. So it was my job over the years to teach them pathology, and I always enjoyed it enormously. And I think that enthusiasm in a teacher gets transmitted to the students, and they know who 
who cares and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think those those recognitions that I got are a reflection of that fact. You had uh, various uh, positions in the School of Medicine. Yes. Teaching as well as administrator. Yes. Tell us about those. What did you teach? Um, I taught uh, always pathology, and my uh, pupils were the physicians in training in the discipline of pathology. That's the house staff or the residents, as they're also called. And I was always involved with that. And then the teaching of the year two students, those were my main mm -hmm. activities mm -hmm. in teaching. In administration, it totally consumed my time after 1972 when I was appointed chairman of the Department of Pathology. And that is a full-time job. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't get back to any bench research after that. And I continued as chairman until 1983. I believe it was 1987, no, 77, that Dean Alan Mathias asked me to be his associate dean for academic affairs, which I continued until the time I retired. And that, again, took time. It seems to me that after you retired, you went back to do some of those tasks. Right. After I retired from, in 1983, from, oh, you mean from the university or from being a chairman? From being a chairman, I retired in 1983. I considered that 10 years was long enough to do that, and I was persuaded to stay another year, but then I left. I think that a person in that job runs out of enthusiasm and inspiration and no longer has new ideas that are worth listening to or implementing. So I left that job, and I then went to do surgical pathology at the Norris Cancer Hospital. Now, surgical pathology was something I was, had an aptitude for and was trained to do, and I enjoyed it very much, and I did that till 1991. Mm -hmm. And then I went off the payroll, shall we say. Mm -hmm. I didn't really retire. I continued with my teaching at the request of the chairman at that time, Dr. Clive Taylor. And I still do some teaching, although I am winding down on that end of things. It seems to me that at one point, uh, after you had retired, you were handing admissions to the medical school. Is that right? Actually, I've never been on the admissions committee. And I think that's kind of a triumph in a way, because that's one of the most demanding, difficult, exacting jobs you can get. Everybody's on your neck, won't you please admit my son, daughter, grandchild, blah, blah, blah. And I just never was into that. So uh, I, I wasn't involved, but I knew the dean for admissions pretty well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I could exert a little nudge, which sometimes helps and sometimes doesn't. But what were the students like when you came? Have they changed very much over the years? Yes, yeah, they've changed. I think the student body is better than it was when I first came here. We're attracting, for whatever reason, more capable, gifted, intelligent students. And I'm very happy about that. And do you think it's different now? I do. I do think it's different. Mm -hmm. What can we do about it? More of the same. Right. More of the same. More yeah. of the same. Right. I don't know the answer to that. I think they come here because they like the curriculum. And as you may know, they get patient contact very early on. There's a course called Introduction to Clinical Medicine, which has been with us since the 60s. And the students love that course. But when they first come to medical school, right away they start seeing patients and dealing with patients and, and that's why they came so they're very pleased with it. Do any of the students go into pathology as a career after they've been graduated? About one or two every year. I'd say that's pretty much the same in all three schools where I've been and across the country. Just enough to replace the pathologists who retire or die or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
but it's not a growing field. N no, although a school can't get along without a pathology department, a medical school. And I know that recently there was a review of the Department of Pathology as part of an ongoing process that is initiated by the provost. And one of the first things that the people who were on his review committee that was internal asked, now does this school really need a Department of Pathology? At which point we all laughed because you can't run a hospital without a pathologist, as you know, I'm sure. Why is that? Pathologists make the diagnosis of cancer, for instance. No pathologist, no cancer diagnosis. Well, that wouldn't work. And uh, there's no getting around it. And so that's the way it is. But there's a lot of other things pathologists do that are necessary as well. But that one really is understood by everyone. But were the influences of some of these people on you or other members of the faculty in the medical school? A special influence. Influence on me? Uh -huh. Yes. And, and also you on them. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Loosley, who was instrumental in drawing my attention to USC, was certainly such a person. I've known him since old days in Chicago. He was also from the University of Chicago. And I kept in touch. We kept in touch over the years. Another person was Helen Martin. I don't know if you know that name. Yes, I know her. Helen Martin is an extraordinary woman. And she was very taken with the idea that I was interested in endocrine pathology because she was, among many other things, very much interested in endocrinology. And so when I came to as a volunteer in 65, she was happy as could be that I would be their endocrine pathologist. And so she nagged Dr. Edmondson to get me back. So I'd say she's the one who influenced me. And of course, Franz Bauer played a great influence on my life because he had the nerve to appoint me as chairman of the Department of Pathology. And that took a lot of guts. Mm -hmm. But his mother because was... you were a woman? Absolutely. I mean, this was not done. So his mother was a physician, and his wife was a physician, and I think they put the screws on him to appoint a woman chairman while he was dean. Mm -hmm. So the first vacancy was in pathology. Dr. Edmondson reached the age of 65, and in those times, that was it. You could hang around afterward, but all administrative responsibility ended at 65. And in retrospect, I think that wasn't a bad idea. Anyway, um, he gave me the job. Well, they had a national search, of, and five people were identified, and the other four said, you must be kidding. And I said, hey, yes, I'll take it. Why did they say you must be kidding? I don't know. I suppose it was the magnitude of the job. You have to run the labs of the county hospital, which, as you know, is a very large job. And the department has had about 80 people in it, pathology faculty. And so I think to an outsider, that looks impossible. None of the other four wanted anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, did um, the pathology department in the School of Medicine work with the pathologists in the county hospital? Yes, they all had academic appointments at USC, but their salaries came from the county of Los Angeles, except for a small token mm -hmm. paid them by the University of Southern California. But USC really had nothing to say about their duties or their evaluation or much of anything else. Mm -hmm. they, once they were given an appointment by the county after six months, that was permanent. Well, it was an untenable situation, and uh, we've been living with it ever since, but gradually moving away from that. So now people have appointments in a department of pathology that has, has something to say about what they do. Do you think that the uh, medical school and the department of pathology are particularly affected by the 
uh, vacillations of the County Board of Supervisors on budget each year? It isn't so much that the County Board of Supervisors is vacillating, it is that, the, that there is no money, uh, as there used to be. Example, when I first came here, there was enough funds to establish new positions at the county uh, by the board. All they had to do was say, yes, go ahead and hire 30 more technologists, for instance. But after Proposition 13, there isn't that kind of discretionary money. And so th the board is between a rock and a hard place, and they they have to vacillate at times. Who do you cut off in favor of this one or that one? And there just has to be a better, more stable source of funding for the county hospital, but that's beside the point. We need the same thing at the School of Medicine because then there is, when they have a crisis at the county, the school has a crisis. And all those people whose salary money is coming from the county, which it now does, but is paid to the school and the school apportions it to the faculty, they have to tell the faculty, well, you may be dismissed if we don't get the money, which is so demoralizing. It's, it's pathetic. And it's, it's not a good situation. So nobody's at fault, but everybody's at fault. Mm -hmm. You see any remedy for that? Well, I always thought that an endowment could be established for faculty salaries. And uh, I've been told, oh, no, nobody would give any money for that. But I don't see why we couldn't try anyway mm -hmm. and gradually move over to something of that nature. As I'm sure you know, an endowment will provide stable source of funds. Now, endowments are based on the stock market, and it comes and goes. But most of the time, it's pretty reliable. And so I think that would be a good way to go. And this ties in with what you were saying at the outset about faculty salaries in the medical school. Yes. So that's something we have to live with. I guess so. And I mean, I don't anymore because I'm retired now, but, but that's but what I see in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just naive, but I thought that would be a reasonable solution. Mm -hmm. And if there were an endowment of that kind, that would be a considerable change. Oh, man. Yes, it would. What else do you think might be improved over the years? Well, I think to have a university hospital was a goal that we had for a long time. And I thought we had achieved it when the Norris Hospital was established. And in spite of some setbacks and drawbacks, we made a hospital that had an international reputation and attracted patients from all over the world. But that hospital's been in the process of being sold to tenant corporations, so I don't and think... the tenant corporation now has the university hospital. Oh, yes, that was the uh, original agreement when the, when the hospital we call University Hospital was established, the tenant would put up the money and run the hospital, and the university would staff it, and we'd be one big happy family. Now, the Tenet Corporation is just that, a corporation, and it has shareholders, and their profits go to the shareholders and the people who run the Tenet Corporation. And that is a difficult situation for an academic institution which in which the profits, if you want to call it that, would go to enrich the faculty and the school. But that's not happening at that, mm -hmm. under that arrangement. So there we are. And I used to think that if we just get out from under the county, things would be so great. Mm -hmm. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Those were the good old days in retrospect. So one of the challenges you see for the university and its medical school is the funding and the uh, role of the of a private corporation mm -hmm. in operating a hospital. To maintain the quality that is required of a 
medical school that wants to be among the first ten. Mm -hmm. That's a big challenge. It is indeed. Do you see other challenges ahead? I'd say that's the main one. The location of the school has not been a problem. East Los Angeles was thought to be an unfavorable place, but isn't South Central the same? And I mean, here we are, and everything is doing well. And it's the same has turned out for the uh, School of Medicine. East Los Angeles is okay. People will come wherever they get good care. So that's not a drawback. And anyway, it's not such a bad neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I certainly know of worse. Um, other challenges? Well, yes. Um, to have a setting where you can render clinical care that's top drawer under the conditions that have been imposed. You have worked with a number of deans while you were at USC. Correct. Dr. Loosley, who recruited you, had left. That's right. He was still on the scene, but he was no longer the dean. And who followed him? I, Dr. Egerberg was the dean when I was appointed in 1967. Then he was succeeded by Franz Bauer, who was dean for five years and quit according to his plan. And Alan Mathias took over. And then when Alan retired, Joseph Vandermeulen was interim dean for a while. And then uh, Robert Tranquata. And after Dr. Tranquata, we had Dr. Ryan, and he's the current dean. Mm -hmm. So there's been a series of really distinguished persons heading up the medical school. That's correct. With different points of view about the teaching of medicine. I think so. Would you tell us about the activities you still pursue on the campus and in the medical school? I continue to teach in year two and I continue to consult. That is, I review slides from difficult cases that people ask me to look at, mainly in the area of endocrine pathology and mainly in the area of thyroid disease, mainly thyroid tumors, mm -hmm. which are always a challenge. Mm -hmm. Not everyone, but many of them are. Mm -hmm. But since your retirement, what other activities have you been involved yes, in? Yes, I've been a member of the Retired Faculty Association. I remember very well my first meeting there. I went, and the room was full of old men. And, uh, <laughs> and Frances Feldman was there, and a couple other women. I thought, well, where are the women? And I thought, wait a minute. This is uh, uh, what the way it was back in 19, whenever it was I was appointed to the faculty. Mm -hmm. There weren't any women. Now there aren't any women coming to the retired faculty because there, <laughs> there aren't very many retired women mm -hmm. of that vintage. Someday there'll be a lot. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I find that the pipeline leaks so that where many women are now entering medical school and graduating, there is a disparity in the number who achieve uh, tenure down the road between women and men. And where the is women that generally or here at this all university? Over here everywhere. and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem, which is recognized mm -hmm. nationally. Don't know the answer to that. Well, I don't know who does, actually. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. uh, when, when you uh, retired, uh, did you change your lifestyle at all? Not really. I had moved to Pasadena when I became chairman because I wanted a bigger house where I could do some entertaining. And I found such a house and I loved it, so I didn't move. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, why should I move? Mm -hmm. And you still travel? Uh-huh, I sure do. Travel and, and doing some birding and photography, and those are my main extracurricular interests. Mm -hmm. And where do you do that? Or um, is it a, a traveling? Not just place, but kind of photography? Well, I go in mainly for still photography, and I like to take pictures of landscapes. 
That's my favorite thing. But I also am pretty much my family photographer, so I'm never in the pictures, but I got mm -hmm. pretty good documentation of everybody since the year one. Mm -hmm. And I first got into photography when I was about seven years old. I bought a camera that cost, would you believe it, 10 cents. Well, this was in the Depression. And they had a coin then, I know you remember, called a mill, which was a tenth of a cent. Mm -hmm. And I tell that to people, and they, but they don't believe me. But we did. Anyway, so this camera cost 10 cents. And I learned all about how to develop pictures and had a great time with it. Mm -hmm. Upgraded it to a camera that cost a dollar. And went on from there. Extravagant. Never looked back. In fact, I really thought I might want to be a photographer, but my parents didn't go along with that. <laughs> they had other ideas. But now that we mentioned your having a camera at age seven, tell us where you grew up. Ah, yes, in a place called Dixon, Illinois. It's a hundred miles straight west of Chicago on a river called the Rock River, which ends in Rock Island, Illinois. Never could figure out why they named it the Rock River, because the Indian name for it was Sinisippi. Sinisippi, Mississippi. And that's really a pretty name, but no one ever picked up on it. But that's where I grew up. And I lived a block from the river. And I think back on it and wonder how my mother could tolerate having her kids be so close to the river but we all learned to swim very young. Mm -hmm. And you could have your own boat when you could swim across the river by yourself. Then you could have a boat and be in the boat by yourself. Mm -hmm. And to have a boat there was as good as having a car because you could get off and away from all adults. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's perfectly legitimate and no one ever questioned where you've been or what you were doing. And you had all your schooling in Illinois, too. All my schooling? Yes, I went to uh, grammar school and high school in Dixon, Illinois. And then I went to the University of Chicago. I applied to one school. That was it. And I had intended to apply to Carleton College and go there for two years and then transfer to Chicago. They had a college representative day at the high school. And so the the men all came and we talked to the different people and I talked to the Carlton man, told him my plan. He says, don't do that. Just go straight to the University of Chicago. And so he says, see that man over there? You go and talk to him. Mm -hmm. I have to thank that Carlton man the rest of my, my, my days because he kept me from doing that. And I went instead to Chicago and Hutchins and Adler were doing their number and the great books and I'll tell you, it was, it was a thrill. And you went to medical school yes, there, too? Yes, I did. Applied to one medical school. That was it. My mother went to school there, and it was a great influence on me, I think, to see the school when I was just a kid, little child. And she had a sister who lived in the neighborhood and also went to school there. So I know the school well, and my two sisters went there ahead of me. Mm -hmm. So that it was a really different climate, not just uh, physical climate. From Dixon, Illinois. When you came yeah. to California. Oh yes, California. Well, I never had been to California until 1950. And my mother said, you've never been to California. I'm going out there, why don't you come with me? So I did, and we came in those days on a train. And we happened, it happened to be the California Zephyr, which went to San Francisco, and then we went down the coast, and then to Los Angeles, and came back on the Super Chief. And I totally, fell in love with California and the West. So after I finished my residency training in Chicago, which was three years, I moved to Los Angeles. And the residency had been increased to four years. And I knew that when I started, I had to get this fourth year. So I went to Old Cedars of Lebanon with Dr. Nathan Friedman and stayed with him until 1958 when I was recruited back to Chicago to be their surgical pathologist and stayed there until 65, and then came back to California. It was a move I gather that you've never regretted. Never, never, never. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is I had a disagreement with the chairman of pathology, mm -hmm. and I decided I was not gonna spend the rest of my life 
dealing with that. Mm -hmm. I, so I left, although I had tenure. They said, well, you can't leave. You have tenure. I said, oh, yeah? Watch. Mm -hmm. So I did. So then you taught here. You did some administrative work in the process. And on, I was going to say graduation, but I really meant retirement. <laughs> right. Uh, you've continued to do pretty much the same much thing. The same thing. But now added such things as the presidency as a retired faculty. That's correct. I was president of the RFA. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you involved in any other activities? Um, not right now. Mm -hmm. But you are on the Emeriti Council. Yes, I am, but I'm uh, withdrawing from that. Mm -hmm. okay. Just take a little rest for a while. Well, I think probably, is there anything you would like to add about what you've done, what you think, what you'd like to do? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we pretty well covered the waterfront here. Nancy, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and your experiences about your time at the University of Southern California in its medical school and on the campus. Well, thank you, Francis, for agreeing to, to be here with me.